last week we uh, talked about the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path, a reoccurring theme, <clears throat> with perhaps a slightly different uh, take on it. So, uh, a couple of people are here that weren't here last week, and uh, besides which maybe the people on YouTube couldn't find the first half of it, so they accidentally stumbled on the second half. So, real quickly, I'll go over what we covered last week. Um, we've all, I think, everyone has heard the story of the Buddha's enlightenment, that at the end of seven weeks, he looked into the sky, saw the morning star, and awoke and declared that he knew the source of unhappiness. I like the word unhappiness because within it is the notion of some suffering, of discontent, dissatisfaction, and he declared that uh, these things were caused by desire and attachment. Uh, but there was a solution to the problem of desire and attachment, and he gave the Eightfold Path. And we talk about the Eightfold Path a lot and, and, and sometimes kind of skim over it. And I said last week um, that the first two on this Eightfold Path, I'm not sure that I really ever understood them, in all honesty. Now the Eightfold Path, this is why you see in, in Buddhism as a symbol of our religion, the wheel with eight spokes on it. Well, a wheel has no beginning and no end. So the Eightfold Path, you don't want to get confused and think that first you have to deal with number one, then once you've got that taken care of, you deal with number two, and you work your way down to number eight. You can jump on that wheel anywhere you want to and start working on it. But because we think in a linear manner, number one was right view. And number one and number two, I sort of always glazed over. Because I, I, if I remember correctly, I think I thought right view was like, well, Buddhism. You have to follow Buddhism. And if you follow Buddhism, then you've got the right view. Um, a number of there, there are a number of scholars, there's a very popular belief that that's not what Buddha was intending when he said right view. He was intending the law of cause and effect. A reaction, there's a reaction of equal value. And we know that as karma. And so, if you accept the idea that if you do harmful things, harm will come to you, if you do nurturing things, Nurturing will come to you if you do bad things, bad things happen to you. If you do good things, whatever that is, good will come to you. So that's basically the law of karma. There's nobody that operates the law of karma. The law of karma is considered to be a natural function of the universe. But I was, when I get ready for this talk, this is probably the first talk in 20 years that I did any preparation for. Because I, I never do any prep. Prep for me is to think about it a couple hours before there's a talk and then to just put it in the back of my head and let it cook and then come in and see what happens with it because that's your real Zen talk right there. And my teacher used to teach us to do that by simply turning to us about five minutes before we had to speak and saying, by the way, you're giving the talk today. And so you had to be quick on your feet. Right resolve. Now, I have to tell you, right view and right resolve, I never think about these things. But if I was to think about it, I would say, well, right resolve means that you've decided you're going to become enlightenment because enlighten, enlightenment is the whole object of Buddhism, right? Wrong. Enlightenment is not the object of Buddhism. The cessation of suffering and unhappiness is the object of Buddhism. 
That's, that's one way of looking at it. That's really what the Buddha taught his disciples, how not to be miserable all the time. Another way of looking at it is we can stop being reborn. I asked my teacher 40 years ago, I said, I don't get it. And, and I hadn't done a lot of reading. Later on, I ran across this all the time. But I said, why, if, you know, if life is so miserable for people, because I didn't think it was particularly miserable, but if life is so miserable for people, why do they keep coming back? Why, why do they keep, re, keep being reborn? Oh. And then he talked about the stages of causality. Oh. But really what he said was, he didn't do it at that time. He said, because they want to. And I went around thinking about that. What do you think? Because they want to. People come back because they want to. Look how many people die in misery, particularly if they know they're dying. They don't want to die. They want to stay here. They want to keep going. No matter what bad state they're in, they don't want to give up this life. And, you know, other religions, we're the only ones there isn't any big reward at the end. The other religions, you get to go to heaven or you get to go to paradise, or there's a cup, there's one that you get to go be with everybody that was ever in your family. We're going to baptize anybody we ever knew, so we have our own little heaven there with all these people. But all these people get a reward. Buddhists don't get any reward for anything. That's, we don't think that's what happens when you die. And I'm not telling you there's a common belief of what happens when you die, because there isn't. But certainly no one thinks that you get to live forever and ever and ever with a smile on your face. So, right resolve. Well, this is the point where I have to tell you that when he laid down this Eightfold Path, he was laying down the Eightfold Path or the eight points of practice for monks. Because for seven years he'd wandered around in the forest, covered in ash and other unspeakable things. For eight years he had starved himself almost to death. For eight years he had done every ascetic practice he could think of. Now he had a little bit of time, he had about half a year in the beginning where he wasn't doing that. He studied with a couple of the great gurus of the time up in the Himalayas because remember the Buddha was actually born in Nepal, what we call Nepal now. But when we talk about it, we see northern India because at one time there was this great unification. So he studied with these teachers, and the teachers taught him two things. And the first thing they taught, and I've mentioned this before because it's kind of stuck in my head. We had this fellow here a few weeks ago, and he started telling me what Buddhism was, and Bhat Hai finally got up and started cleaning because he couldn't take it anymore. And one of the things he declared to me was that uh, nowhere in the Pali Sutras could you find emptiness. <laughs> And I just laughed at him. I thought, what are you talking about? The Buddha studied with two great gurus. One guru taught him how to meditate. The other guru taught him, wait for it, about emptiness, about shunyata. So in the very beginning of the Buddha's path, before he was ever enlightened, he had two tools that he was using. One was the notion of emptiness, and the other was how to meditate. But he didn't understand the nature of life and why we were unhappy in our lives. So I'm, I, I'm, I'm always surprised. Vui Meng mentioned that today, and people come by to teach Roshi. <laughs> and you do. You guys teach me all the time. But you don't teach me things like, oh, you know, that's really not a Buddhist idea. No, actually it's about a 5,000-year-old Hindu idea called Shunyata. So, this resolve is really the resolve to be a monk. Resolve to leave home. A resolve to only worry about 
getting yourself under control. And there's two things that have to be learned. Metta, or metta, and compassion. And metta is non, it, sometimes it's, it's translated as loving kindness. But it's non-possessive love. And the other is compassion. And these are powerful ideas. But you know, people are selfish, right Jane? He doesn't know you. Jane's a psychologist. That's Dr. Jane. <laughs> and she knows all about selfish people. They say one thing, oh, I want. But really what they want is what they want. <laughs> and so this is humanity. And the Buddha said, you have to have the resolve to let go of all these things that you think you need and leave home and become a searcher, a shramana which is, means a searcher, a religious searcher. And we think of them as monks. And in India, they don't look like Buddhist monks because they have real long hair and they don't take a lot of baths and, <laughs> and stuff like that. You can tell they're in the neighborhood because of the smell, but they're holy men. And then we have speech and conduct and livelihood. And I pointed out that those three that's where the five precepts that we have. That when somebody finally went to the Buddha and said, look, this monk thing, it's okay, but I don't want to do it. I think I want to help people by being a psychologist, but I don't think I want to be a monk. Man, I'd have to give up everything. <clears throat> I'd have to give up my favorite tea. Jane likes tea. Mm -hmm. I'd have to stop worrying about what tea I had. I mean, I just have to take whatever came along. Or I'd have to give up my Vietnamese coffee, you know, and have to drink what everybody else drinks. And so the Buddha gave, when somebody came, a lot of people came, and they said, we're trying to follow your teachings. We, we need some, some precepts. We need some rules to follow so that we can practice what you're preaching. And he thought about it and said, come back tomorrow. They came back and he said, here you go. Here's the five things I want you to try to observe. I want you to try not to take life. I want you to try not to say things that aren't true. And while we're on the, on the subject of speech, I want you to try not to do backbiting. I want you to try to stop gossiping. I want you to stop saying things that make you look important and someone else look less. So that's your speech. I want you not to stop, I want you to stop taking anything that doesn't belong to you. A scholar about 30 years ago, roughly 30 years ago, looked at that particular one from the standpoint of monks, because monks aren't supposed to steal either, and he figured out that the value of, of something that was stolen that would get you in trouble was 25 cents. So today it would probably be 75 cents, less than a dollar said, so don't take, don't take things. And he said, don't engage in uh, improper sexual conduct. And at this temple, we, when someone becomes a Buddhist and we give them a nice full certificate, we give them the precepts, we say, don't commit adultery. Because I personally believe Americans have a real problem with what improper sexual conduct actually is. And so I think adultery just really zeroes in on our problem that we you know, rationalize away. Right, Jane? I mean, guys, they can rationalize all kinds of reason why it's okay. But they made a promise. So, and then the last one is not to become intoxicated or drink intoxicants. And later on, we added drugs. The Buddha never had drugs in there. He said, don't become intoxicated. Because there are certain nationalities like the Indians and the Japanese and the Koreans and somebody told me somebody else, they just drink till they fall down. You know, so he said, okay, don't do that. All of those things in there, you have to understand. These precepts that we gave to lay people was about not causing unhappiness with other people. 
the first level here is to stop making other people unhappy. It, it doesn't mean to be Pollyanna. It doesn't mean that you have to oh, go along with whatever, whether you agree with it or not. It means don't take what belongs to somebody else. It may be something that's extremely valuable to them. And the monetary value of it is irrelevant. It may be something they were given by someone that was special. And it doesn't matter what you think. It belongs to them. Don't take what belongs to somebody else. Don't say things that will hurt people. Don't become intoxicated because you'll destroy your family. You'll destroy your life. You'll drive, and he was talking to men, remember? Originally, every, it was all men. And so he centered on the men, even though he had great respect for women. He said, if you go out drinking, the next thing you know, you've destroyed your family life. You've lost, you've gambled, and you've lost your house. Your wife doesn't have any place to live. Your children don't have any place to live, and you don't have any money to buy food. It was the last of the precepts that the Buddha put out. Originally, he only put out four precepts. Later on, he put in drinking. He said, don't drink. I want you to just think of the entire country of India as a bunch of alcoholics. How much can an alcoholic drink? Zero. You know, every, every few years, every few decades, somebody comes along and says, oh, you know, if you're this kind of alcoholic, you can go ahead and have a couple cocktails at night. No, you can't. If you're really an alcoholic, you can't drink at all because you're addicted. And it's not your fault. I'm a firm believer in the genetics of alcoholism. So we're not going to beat up, mentally beat up people that are alcoholics. We're just going to try to help them to understand they can't drink. They need to make friends with Pepsi Cola and Orange Crush, you know, because that's all they can deal with. And that's what the Buddha said, just don't drink. It makes it so simple. The last three, which I did not get into last week, which I will now. Oh, we're out of time. No, we got a couple minutes left. <laughs> the last three is right effort. And when I looked these up to see what somebody else's opinion of them were, and it's, it's always nice to see someone else's opinion because it gives you another angle to look at. And you know, none of us ever see things the same. I, I've talked about that over and over again. I mean, visually, we do not see the same thing. And we never will. There's no way we can make that happen. Now, we can say, there's a bird. That's about as far as it goes. Look, a dog. Oh, a dog bit me. And we'll agree on those things. But other than that, we're not going to be seeing the same thing. And if you don't believe me, when I was a kid, an eyewitness that saw a guy commit a crime, that guy was going to jail. And nowadays, it's the worst kind of evidence there is because we know that three people will see three different people at the same event and give three different descriptions of what they look like. And it's not because there's anything defective about them, it's just the way we see. You know, if we're short and the person was tall, they were a tall person. If we're tall, they're not, they don't look so tall to us. I don't know why this is hard for people to understand. You know how I know when somebody's taller than me? I have to look up. That's the only reason I know they're taller than me. If they're a little bit taller than me, my eyes just go up a little bit. I was fascinated as a young person about these discrepancies in the way we see things. People would say, he's really tall, isn't he? I go, well, a little bit. Well, he's on the basketball team. Well, is he that tall? And I'd say, Bob, how tall are you? And he'd say, well, I'm 6'3". Oh, you're three inches taller than me. See, and I never thought that was really tall, but then other people looked at me and they thought I was tall back when I was a kid. So, right effort. Guard against sensual thoughts. 
What's a sensual thought? I can tell you where my mind went when I was a kid, what that meant, sensual thought. You ever start to have your mouth water thinking about that dinner <coughs> that you were invited to? Somebody's got this fabulous meal. You know, in the temple we're vegetarian, but outside the temple people eat whatever they want. Maybe somebody's got some barbecued ribs, you know, and they've invited you over, and your mouth starts to water. <laughs> Even thinking about it, that's sensual. It's sensual. Now, how does that become a problem? Well, in Zen, we're authorities on this. It only becomes a problem if you're unhappy because you got there and they burned all the ribs so you're having hot dogs. Have you ever seen anybody that got upset because I saw them all the time in the army. They went into the mess hall and the spaghetti wasn't like mom made it. When I was at Fort Campbell, we had a cook. God, this guy was fabulous. He only cooked once a month. You know, he was in charge of the whole kitchen and everything. So he had people doing all the cooking. But once a month he made spaghetti because he was Italian. I mean, he was Italian like he spoke Italian, and mom and dad came from the old country. And when he made spaghetti, nobody missed that meal. Except there were people in there that it just didn't taste like mom's. Because mom went into the back room and opened the can of Chef Boyardee <laughs> spaghetti and dumped it into the pan. And that's what he grew up with. That's what I grew up with. And I thought that was spaghetti. And it took a little adjustment for me to realize there was more than one kind of spaghetti. So this thing, this thing of sensuality, sensuality is not just sex. Sensuality is anything that gets us emotionally excited. And it can be going to see beautiful pictures. It can be going to hear great music, okay? It can be having a great meal. It can be an ice cold Coca-Cola over crushed ice. There is nothing like Coca-Cola over crushed ice. You can put ice cubes in a glass all day long and it doesn't come close. If it doesn't make your teeth hurt when you drink it, it's not cold enough. And these are actually sensual things. Guard against sensual desire. If I walk around all day, my latest addiction is slushies at, what is that place? The latest, it's the only, Sonic. Sonic. It's the only thing I get there on happy hour. Because it's a couple bucks for a big, large cherry slush. Okay, and with this weather we've been having, for those of you that live someplace other than in the desert, it's been knocking at 104 and 5 and 6 with high humidity like Florida. And there is nothing like one of those cherry slushes. But if you start revolving around that cherry slush or those ribs <laughs> or, that, or that concert, and that's all you can think of, you're being driven by your sensual desires. So at some point you have to learn to just let things be, but it doesn't mean you can't enjoy stuff. I use, I go through various addictions, almost all of them are food. You know, for years I was addicted to hot fudge sundaes. You know, and then, then I, I got, I broke that addiction and then I went along for a while and then it became chocolate and then I had to break that addiction and that was, that was hard. I had to stop, you know, seeing my, my dealer. I stayed out of stores, didn't go anywhere near the candy aisle because of that. And that was a late addiction. I grew up with no candy. Never was in the house. Not really. My mom would sneak chocolate bars. I probably inherited it from her. But she never had one for us. I'd come in and surprise her. <laughs> she'd, she'd have a Coca-Cola and a chocolate bar in her hand. I go, oh.
mindfulness. We're thinking monk now. But most of this stuff applies to everyday life. Mindfulness is, and I've talked about this, it's a very popular form of meditation. Um, everybody's in, certifying it now. Uh, we have a fellow that comes here that is a psychologist, different than Jane. Jane works with people that have problems. He works with teachers, which probably also have problems. He, he teaches courses on educational psychology. So he doesn't have to deal with the guy that's yelling and screaming and throwing things. He just goes, okay, come back during my office hours and I may or may not be here, you know. But he uh, did some certifying in mindfulness and he wanted, I wrote a letter of recommendation. He wanted to be able to do workshops on mindfulness. And it's spreading across the U.S. and I guess it's, I guess it's more common than I thought it was. I had a lady back in Chicago send me a bunch of email, or not email, but uh, YouTube type things. And they're putting mindfulness meditation into grade schools and middle schools and high schools. And apparently that's starting to happen out here. And you know why? Because I know a guy that's doing it. I just remember why I know this. He uh, belongs to an organization that I go visit once a month. and. Uh, he got all excited when he found out I was a Buddhist. And I could I had no idea why he was all excited. Until a few weeks later I met someone and they said, Oh, you know Charles. I belong to the retired the California Retired Teachers Association. That and five dollars gets you a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and I found out Charles is going around to grade schools and doing these little 15, 20 minute things with the kids on mindfulness and maybe some meditation. But the Buddha said that was number seven. And mindfulness, as the Buddha taught it, was paying attention. And mindfulness, as the Buddha taught it, was being in this moment. Well, it doesn't matter whether you're a monk or a lay person to pay attention and be in this moment. Right, Sandy? Yeah, it's, you can do that. And then the eighth one was right concentration, which for years I didn't know what that was. I, I really thought it was, okay, I'm looking at this. You're not going to distract me no matter what you do. I'm going to look at this. That's concentration, right? No, that's not what he meant. He meant samadhi. And samadhi is the, that state that is missed by all these little groups that do mindfulness. And they're... There's some big groups. They're not necessarily little groups. They're big groups of people that get together and they do meditation for half an hour and they do mindfulness and they do scanning and they see what's going on with their body and with their breath and with their mind and they're looking at it. And then after half an hour, then they get some tea and they talk for an hour, an hour and a half about what they just did. You know? And it always struck me as really weird. <clears throat> Years ago, I did archery. And I'd go out and I'd shoot archery for about 45 minutes and my arms would seize up because I had a really heavy bow. And it would be like, okay, I went and shot for 45 minutes and now we're going to talk about it for two hours. What are we going to talk about? <laughs> Bot High over here, he was, when he was first coming here on retreats, during the breaks, he'd run up and down the road because he had so much energy. We mentioned that today. That was back when he was young and healthy. He'd just be running up and down that road, sweating like a fiend. But when he got done, he didn't come over and say, okay, I'd like to talk for the next hour about running. Well, mindfulness is paying attention. So what is there to talk about? Other than you're not paying attention. And maybe you should pay attention just a little bit better. Well, that's not the way it's been interpreted, but the Buddha said there were two types, well, let me back up. There were two types of meditation that the Buddha taught. He taught Vipassana, which is mindfulness, and that's paying attention. It's not really meditation. Unless you say, well, I'm doing meditation as I move through the world. I'll buy it. Okay, if you're paying attention to everything as you move through the world, that's good. And then he taught Samatha. And Samatha is what we do in Zen. 
And that's concentration. And it's very pointed. And in the beginning, you can do some exercises. A few weeks ago, we taught a class on the various uh, techniques in meditation. Jane missed that. She might even have told me she missed that. She wished she hadn't. But we'll do it again in a couple, three years, because everybody has fun with it. And we learn different ways to focus. But ultimately, you have to let go of these devices that you use, whatever it might be. It may be a sound, uh, you know, TM meditation. They, they, they had a, a mantra, like we do Om Mani Padme Hum before we start. Does everybody know why we do Om Mani Padme Hum before we start? Because my teacher did Om Mani Padme Hum <laughs> before he started. <laughs> Until I met Tianan, I'd never done Om Mani Padme Hum. We just sat down and started meditating. So, you could do that. Some people repeat that in their mind. It gives them a focus. Some people simply follow their breath in and out. Good, good focus in the beginning. Some people see the Buddha in their mind. Some sutras say, see the Buddha. It's a good focus. Because it's hard to sit there without thinking about something. Because we are the animal that talks to itself all the time. I wake up in the middle of the night and I interrupt my conversation. You ever done that, Jane? <laughs> yeah. Always and I'm going, yeah. And I and, and sometimes it's like, okay, I squeeze my eyes together because I want to know how it comes out. You know? <laughs> What's he gonna say? I'm waiting, I'm waiting. Oh, it's gone, it's gone. So the Buddha said, right meditation. Now, there are people to get all involved because the Buddha talked about the night that he awakened. Actually, it was a morning. But he talked about leading up to that morning. And he talked about going through four levels of samadhi. And it's described as the jhanas. And the jhanas are places. It's implying he went to four places. That's a, the simplest translation I can think of. And it started off. And if, if I recited them to you, they wouldn't make any sense at all because it's something like he entered the state where he realized that all things were empty and they had no form. Then he entered the state where all things had form, but they were totally empty. And then he entered the state where they didn't have any form, but they were empty. And, that, and it sounds like nonsense. But what's happening is he's just letting go. Because if you're not thinking about something, if you're just being aware, there's our mindfulness, but you're not you're not doing what people typically do with vipassana. They they you know if their knee hurts they look at the knee because they want to understand that that pain is an illusion. One time I was driving along with some students and the student behind me said, "I don't understand this because if pain's an illusion, you know." Uh, blah, 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 blah. And I said, do you think pain's an illusion? It's, uh, we're deluded about it? We just manufacture it in our mind? It's just something we made up? Because that's the way Indians think. Oh, the whole, not, not all schools. But there's one school that says everything in existence is manufactured by the mind. And by the way, there's a school of Buddhism that says everything is created by the mind. And it's not real. And so I reached behind me and swatted this kid. It was a girl. Just slapped her good on the leg. She was wearing shorts. And I said, was that real? And she went, ah, 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 ah. I said, I guess it's real then. So I guess pain isn't something the mind manufactures. Or your mind is a lot faster than I am because it just manufactured that pain. So what are we talking about when we say there's, a, there's illusion? Well. The mind is incredibly powerful. If part of your body starts to hurt, it doesn't matter what it is. If part of your body starts to hurt, I just, I developed a new disease. <laughs> it's just, it's endless. I now have gout. Oh, it just goes on and on and on. And so, if I think about my foot that hurts, 
And that's all I think about. You know how you know how much pain I'm in? It goes from about this much pain. And it just starts getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger like this. The mind, you have no idea how powerful the mind is. I can make that pain so big that I start to shake and I start to sweat. And I start to agonize and I'm looking for someone to give me opium, the latest the latest addiction we have now. Okay, I got a magazine that wants to talk all about people that have been taking opium for eight or nine years, and gosh, they're addicted. Really? <laughs> really? <laughs> After eight or nine years of opioids for pain, they're addicted? I know a young lady that's in pain 24 hours a day, and she absolutely doesn't want to take her pain pills, so she takes them maybe once every couple of weeks when it just knocks her down and she can't do anything else because the pain will never go away. She broke her neck. She's stuck with that pain for the rest of her life. And she refuses to take her opioid medication every day so she doesn't feel the pain. Because it also disconnects her from the world. So what we learn in our meditation is to go ahead and let the knee hurt or let the foot hurt or let the back hurt. And it's real. And just let it go ahead and hurt. But we're not going to focus on it. We're not going to let it overwhelm us. And then we start moving through the levels of samadhi. And the levels of samadhi, eventually we get to the point where we're thinking of everything. And when we think of everything, we're thinking of the universe. And that's what I experience when I sit in meditation is I experience the universe. And Meister Eckhart would say, I experience God. And I wouldn't argue with him because, you know, no two of us see things the same. So if he wants to call it God, I just call it the universe. It doesn't matter to me what it's called. If you connect with everything that exists, guess who disappeared? You did. And now you're just experiencing the universe. So when you put this up, where's he at? He's coming out of Samadhi. <laughs> when you put this up, do you 